Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with Venezuelan-born jazz drummer, percussionist, and composer Marlon Simon. We caught up with him about his new 2024 CD, on different paths. He has traveled a myriad of different paths over the course of his nearly four decade career. There is a personal journey that has led him from a small town in his native Venezuela to pursuing jazz in Philadelphia, New York, and now his current home of Katy, Texas. We cover quite a bit. Enjoy this interview. Hey, thank you for taking a minute out for Neon Jazz today. I appreciate it. No problem. Let's do it. Yeah. Okay. So before we get into the newest album, Different Paths, I want to kind of cover what we lived through for the last three and a half years and it you know worked its way on the musicians community in a specific way how did you survive the pandemic and how did it change you oh that's uh, well one of the main uh, reasons why i wrote the music for that record was the pandemic because i was you know locked and uh, um I took the time to to write some of the music, and uh, I would say to I, I would say the pandemic forced me to connect more with myself, you know, to to be in touch with myself and uh, and a lot of thinking about how we live nowadays as a society, um, and I came to a conclusion that we have to change somehow the direction of that we're going in, you know, so much violence nowadays and, and and war. During the pandemic I did a lot of thinking besides uh, concentrating on writing this music. So it really changed me on uh, the connection with myself spiritually and uh, even intellectually also, you know. It's, um, it was a very important stage for me as an artist, the pandemic, yes. So, specifically from an artistic standpoint, how did you put together and orchestrate the songs on this album? Yeah. Well, the album, the first idea came out of a proposal that I did for the Guggenheim Foundation where I, I was thinking of combining classical instrumentation with jazz instrumentation and then try to do a blend of classical music with jazz and Afro-Caribbean rhythms. That was the proposal initially for the Guggenheim and uh, they, they look like they like it. So, so that's how it was created. I was thinking to blend elements of classical music with jazz, improvisation, and Afro-Caribbean rhythms. So that was the the intention of this album. So what are you ultimately hoping the listener gets from this album? You know, um, the the... The main thing that I hope is that the listener can realize that uh, we can uh, unite, we can uh, work to combine, in our case, not only music genders, but to combine the different races and uh, values that we have all together. And there is a way I'm sure there is a way, not only through music, but also in life, to blend these, to live in a more uh, in a more peaceful way, with more understanding, and with more um, conscious consciousness that we can live together. You know, even though we are from different backgrounds, everybody. We are children of the universe. I believe we can live together without war and uh, and uh, more understanding among every culture. That's the main thing I, I hope the music can uh, stimulate that on the listener. So you've taken quite a geographical path in your life, Venezuela to Philadelphia, New York City, 
Texas. Talk to me a little bit about how this jazz journey, this music journey, this love of, of playing the music and ultimately making your life, how did it all begin for you? Well, it began at an early age. You know, I grew up in Venezuela, which you have to see, for example, the geographical location in Venezuela gives the country the advantage of receiving influence from everywhere, from everywhere, from North America, from the Caribbean, and um, is the first port of entry in Latin America. So we received all kinds of uh, uh, cultures and uh, musical genders in Venezuela. So from the beginning, I was already listening to a lot of different genders, even though I was more concentrated on, on dance music at that time. There was a friend of mine who brought... I remember he brought a, a, you know, at that time we had those Betamax that we used to look on on, on that machine on TV, the, the VHSs. And he brought a, a Betamax and he said, Marlon, you have to see this. And, and he showed me, I don't know where he got it. I believe this was the a video of a birthday of Nancy Reagan in the White House. And on that birthday they had a, jazz musicians invited. There was a DC Gillespie and Chick Corea and Miroslav Beatles and Roy Haynes. And I was looking at that and I didn't understand what was going on musically. And that was the first time that I got really curious about jazz and how I, I, I wanted to understand what was going on. So I took out, I, I took, I got out of Venezuela with the support of my father. Uh, to Philadelphia first, went to University of the Arts for uh, two years, and then went to New York and finished my career on a contemporary jazz music performance at the New School for Social Research. Um, between Philadelphia and New York, I was there for about, what, uh, 25 years, 26 years maybe. But uh, I have a little bit of problems with the winters over there, so... It gives me a little bit uh, uh, lack of motivation during the winter, so I decide to move to a place where I can get more, you know, more sunlight, and the winters are not as hard. So that's why I end up in in Texas now. But I really miss the the music scene from New York and Philadelphia. But uh, as we say, we cannot have uh, everything in life. So that's what I'm doing right now. I, I understand that sentiment. Kansas City is going through quite a, a cold fall right now. <laughs> so I, I, I'm right there with you with the warmth. I, I prefer it. Um, so talk to me a little bit about the very first show. I know the Dizzy, seeing Dizzy, it's, it's a celebration, and, and wrapping your head around jazz was one thing. But what was, what was it like the first time you saw jazz live with your own eyes? What was that show, and what was that feeling like? Well... The first time I saw jazz live was when I came to Philly, of course. And I went to a very famous uh, jazz club in Philadelphia that was called Ort Leaves in North Philly on 3rd and Poplar Street. This place had all the jazz musicians from Philadelphia there every weekend. And I went there for the first time when I came to, to Philadelphia. And I was listening to it. I, I still couldn't really understand what was going on in every aspect of the music. But uh, I had the feeling that the artists, the, the musicians that were doing this, were expressing them, themselves with such a freedom, you know, at that moment that I became even more interested because I realized it looked like they can manifest musically what they're feeling, their emotions and everything. And uh, it, it hooked me up, you know, really got me hooked, the the, the jazz elements, mainly harmonically, um, not as much as rhythmically because rhythmically I, ha I had a strong background coming from uh, from Latin America. But harmonically and the improvisation was very interesting to me. 
that was the first the first place where I went to in Philadelphia called Old Leaf. I believe I saw saxophonist Larry McKenna, pianist uh, Sid Simmons, and uh, bassist Charles Fambro that night, and I also met them, you know, and became very good friends of them. Ah, Mickey Rocker was on drums, and I became very good friends of the, with them, and uh, from there on, the whole journey began in Philadelphia. So you must have learned so much from being in, in, in those hotbeds of jazz, being in Philadelphia and New York. Um, how much did you grow during that time? You know, now that you're in, in Texas, you're not there anymore. Do you ever look back and think about how much you grew being in, in those kind of hotbeds? That's one of the main reasons I would love to be there, you know, still to be there, and that's what I miss. But for, for like I told you, for different reasons and my mental health also during the winter doesn't do that great in those areas. But I think those were, those were the best learning years of my life, you know, in Philadelphia, and then later on in New York, going to all those different places I used to follow also where my brother Edward Simon was playing at and he was at that time with Bobby Watson with a very, very good band called Horizon and Victor Lewis was on drums and I used to follow them in New York everywhere and I used to follow Jerry Gonzalez and the Four Apache Band and uh, those oof, were were all my learning years, constantly learning, constantly practicing, and constantly growing in the music, and I really miss that, and I miss that now, nowadays, you know, because uh, uh, there is always place to grow, always, and I think I, I can even grow further if I was living over there, yes. Yeah, that's the one thing that's really nice about living in Kansas City is that Bobby Watson's here, and he plays quite a bit. And to see his command and presence in the history, it's always just so nice to see that unfold live. Mm, yeah, Bobby is a legend. Bobby is a walking legend. I worked with his band as a percussionist uh, for a couple of years, and uh, I'm on one of his records. I think it's called Us. Uh, Silence as is, as it's kept, something like that is it. And he's a great, uh, he's a walking legend, great person. And yes, I know he's in Kansas City. I think he's the chairman of the jazz department over there. Correct. He also recorded on my first and third album, Bobby. He recorded on the music of Marlon Simon. On the first one, Bobby Watson with Brian Lynch and Jerry Gonzalez. And then Bobby also recorded on a, a record called Rumba a la Patato. I did for Ubiquiti Records. So he's always been one of my mentors, you know, Mr. Bobby Watson, yes. Have you played here in Kansas City? No, I haven't played in Kansas. Um, I'm trying to talk to the the... There is a radio station. What's the jazz radio station, the main one in Kansas? Uh, um, KPR. It's uh, correct. Jazz in the night, I believe. Yes. Correct, correct. Uh, I hope that the, <clears throat> the publicists will send my music to them to see if I can start uh, sounding more in, over in Kansas City. And, of course, it would be an honor to play there. I want to check with Bobby also what is the route to find, to see if he recommends me a couple of venues in Kansas for me to look for an opportunity to to play there. Uh, you brought to my mind a very good idea now. <laughs> good. Yeah, we would love to see you here. So, yeah, you know, yeah. you've, you've been at this for decades, and I'm curious, what do you like the best about being a professional musician? Of all of the myriad of things that you do, what do you look forward to the most? Um, the... Music is is music has been my life, man. It's been my vehicle, my vehicle to to be able to overcome and defeat the different obstacles you encounter in life. 
So to me, music is is like my religion, uh, and I think uh, it's been a very good companion for me. And um, what can I tell you? It's, it's in my mind all the time. I'm getting ready here to do some rehearsals in New York for the tour, and uh, it's uh, I would say is the most important aspect in my life. Music, yes. So at the end of the day, why do you love jazz? Because I can express myself in any form and uh, express my emotions through the music uh, spontaneously. That's the main reason. So everyone out there has a perception of you, family, friends, and fans, but ultimately you're in control. You're living your life. What's your perception of you? Who do you think you are? Wow. (laughs) (laughs) Wow, you're getting into some... uh, Well, I think, um, like all of us, I think I'm I'm, uh, part of the manifestation of the universe. I think we all manifest the cause of the universe. And in my uh, specific case, I do it through music. People will do it to different talents that they have. But I think we all are uh, manifesting the main source of the universe, you know, you can call it God, or you can call it uh, any label that you can put on it. Uh, but that's, I think, is the main reason we are here, you know, to manifest the will of God or the universe. So do you have any live shows as we kind of start heading into the beginnings of spring and the years opening up? What are you looking for as far as live shows? Well, besides this tour, I mean, we're going to go on a tour promoting the album. Uh, the album come out officially today, actually. It's out today, officially. And um, the tour is going to cover New York, New Jersey, Baltimore, Philadelphia, and New Hampshire. After that tour, I'm going to start knocking the door at uh, some festivals. I already have uh, contact with the uh, Washington DC Jazz Festival. They're interested in bringing the band. So my main goal is to expose this music uh, with with as much crowd as I can. And that's, uh, that's what I'm looking into the future. Also, Try to do something in Europe, if possible, where I've been, I have been there before, doing works, different kind of works in France with French musicians. So, you know, it's, it's, uh, I'm gonna try, but whatever the universe put on your, on your, on your way, you know, on your path, sometimes you cannot really choose that. You have to, to wait to see what do you encounter and then do, do what you're supposed to do. Yes. So do you do anything special on album release days? Is is there anything that uh, you do to celebrate it and christen it? Um, yes, rehearsals. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, right we have a very, very low, long rehearsal. T- today I'm rehearsing the horns as a sectional only. And uh, then uh, the Sunday and Monday we have like a three hours rehearsal each day here in New York with the full band. Well, not the full band from the record because the record recorded with 10 people, but I couldn't bring the 10-piece the band. I'm, I'm using a six-piece band and I'm rearranging the music a little bit, but we have a lot to rehearse. I mean, the music is uh, a little bit, uh, it's a little bit difficult technically, but I think it uh, preserves the integrity and the part of uh, the the emotion the 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 beauty of music i don't wanna i don't i don't like to write uh, 
so technical that it becomes, you know, like a brain, brain element more than for my heart. So the, the, most of the music is, I've written what I heard, what I feel it on my heart and, uh, and they have some technical elements that we have to work on, but with rehearsal, everything will be okay. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, I urge everybody to run out and grab this album. It's a wonderful listen and um, check out any live shows that might be coming up. Thank you so much, Marlon, for taking some time out to talk with us here at Neon Jazz and best of luck with everything. Thank you to Neon Jazz, to you for the opportunity and I wish there were more people with ears like you. Thanks for listening and tuning in to another Neon Jazz interview, where we give you a bit of insight into the finest players and minds in Venezuela, Philadelphia, Texas, New York City, Kansas City, and spots all over the world giving fans all that jazz. Thanks to Marlon for his time and story. If you want to hear more Neon Jazz interviews, you can find us on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Subscribe to us at YouTube, and for everything Neon Jazz, go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the jazz, my friends. Beyond Jazz.